and it's ironic that you go to the website and they talk about the greener Central Park and what everybody who's living in Central Park is recommended to do is to get energy efficient vehicles, which is an absurdity because if it was planned with actual connections to the city and it was planned in a truly sustainable way, we wouldn't need this. So again, this kind of offloading of the responsibility by the developers to the public is, um, it's, well, in my estimation, it's not acceptable. Um, likewise, uh, you know, I, th I think this kind of tragedy of taking something like the Breton Flats, regardless of the fact, you know, it's history, which is unfortunate. <clears throat> you know, in 2000, in the year, you know, 2000, we end up with this incredible, uh, in the 21st century, we have this incredible piece of land. It's on the river. It has these amenities like the, uh, the museum. And now again, it's just being turned over into suburban development. So. You know, this is already done. You know, I suppose it's, uh, we still have to see what happens with Lansdowne. But the point is, it's, um, it's perverse to be taking space which could be created into these amenities that are then going to be the drivers for density. So when the developers of Lansdowne say, hey, you know, there's this mandate for densification, so we're going to fill in your public spaces, that makes no sense. If you develop Lansdowne or any of these areas as beautiful urban public spaces, be they parks or other kinds of public spaces, then d uh, density will come along the perimeter just because that's what the market does. I um, want to point out, you know, we talk about, well, hey, do we need more parks? We have the canal. Well, you know, the canal really isn't a park. The park is a very beautiful driver's amenity, but we have lots of components of the canal which look like this. And if you're out with a couple of little kids or you're trying to go, you know, uh, a, a more elderly person, this is hardly a peaceful or beautiful experience. This is not a park. But there is one moment in the season of the canal where it truly does become an urban park, which is in the winter when it's frozen. So suddenly, everybody's out there. They put in the kiosks. You can go to the bathroom. You can get a drink. You can stop and rest if you're tired. But you can't get a drink, stop and rest, or do any of those things in this condition. So what we're looking to achieve, or what I would be looking to achieve, is more of these real park situations where everybody's out there. We have people from every kind of walk of life, every demographic, every kind of ethnicity is out here. But in the summer, it reverts to being a place for generally kind of middle-aged, physically fit people. <laughs> Which, you know, again, that's not a park. It's not democratic. Um, this is an example of, you know, of a, not an example, it's an image of Ottawa as it is now. We have the kind of uh, Confederation Square and a few of the larger um, green areas. And what I started to tag was um, just available, quote, available land. Oh my gosh. Um, quote, available land, which is, uh, say, basically parking lots, which are going to be developed by real estate speculators. Um, and thinking, well, you know, what about the city developing these and then the real estate speculators will be that much more happy to develop even more, uh, you know, development around these places. And uh, just to give you an example, just a few blocks from here, off of Lorne, this is a, a monastery, it's up on uh, Upper Lorne. Uh, from this, pl this is completely walled in, it's about, uh, probably built in around 1875, and we have these kind of very working class homes that were built, and so these homes are looking at this park. This park right now is up for sale by uh, the monastics who own this place, but it's only up for sale to the city. So they're saying, hey, you know, Ottawa, you can buy this. If you don't buy it, we're going to keep it. We're not going to turn it over to development. But at some point, you know, as this order diminishes, this land is just going to be sold to the highest developer. So I just do, you know, I can't fathom whatever the cost of it is, that cost could not be so great to make it um, uh, uh, an unwise purchase for the transformation. Again, this is right next to Chinatown, right? One of the densest neighborhoods. Uh, you know, the, the requirement for these kinds of spaces is crucial. Again, basic linkages. You know, if you were walking from Ottawa South to Lansdowne, whatever Lansdowne becomes, you have a choice. You could walk with your several kids and family across this uh, approximately meter and a half wide sidewalk along uh, over the Bank Street Bridge, and you could walk all the way around, or which means you're obviously not going to do it. You're going to get in your car and you're going to drive all the way around and then we need to provide parking and asphalt parking and all of this. Or you build a bridge and you just let everybody walk, which they would probably prefer to do anyway. Um, so I started thinking then, again, just right next door to here, where are our sites that are kind of ripe for these kinds of um, developments? And maybe this is something that could come up in the workshops, you know, from the smallest site, like the small Pocket Park to much larger areas. We need different scaled spaces. You know, for example, we have this um, uh, uh, this site, uh, uh, um, city center, which is right 
you know, it's a perfect thing. It's right off of a rail line, which offhand we look at this and we think, oh, that's a, uh, a liability. Well, it's not. It's a way for people to get to this site, which can be re-envisioned as something that becomes an anchor for the neighborhood. So, for example, just like a quick pass with some of the, uh, the folks in my office, you know, we thought, okay, let's add a bus stop, uh, let's add an O train stop, let's uh, take this ramp above and spend, instead of spending money to demolish it and to dump the concrete into landfills, it becomes a quieter strolling place for you know, for people who want that activity as opposed to people who want the active soccer field. So you segregate these kinds of programs so that everybody, you know, can come here and enjoy it. It's not just one component of the uh, population. Put in things that are more exotic. Rock climbing. Put in things that are going to have everybody here at once. And by all means, put in bathrooms and some water fountains, right? And then, you know, this kind of uh, program then completely begins to transform these incredibly tight, Areas you know which um, which need these kinds of urban lungs like uh, like Chinatown. Um, on the subject of linkages, I started to wonder too why uh, a place like Hull, Mizenov, which has um, certainly uh, less uh, uh, well a lower tax uh, claim than we have here in Ottawa, they could take this. So when I moved to Ottawa about nine years ago, this is what Mizenov looked like, and this is what it looks like now. We have nice street lighting, uh, sidewalks are widened. Uh, people are separated from the traffic by trees, uh, median strips are planted, right? So within a few years, Hull went from this to this, okay? They also started putting in these kind of sculptural uh, barriers, this kind of uh, glass panels that shield noise to the residences beyond. And again, you know, how is it, or isn't it remarkable, that this could suddenly be turned into this, right? So of course, you know, do you want to walk to work from here to here along this? No. You know, but walking along this, it's a pleasure to go to work. And then these kinds of lighted sculptures so that even in the, in the snowy weather, right, when the, the, uh, the grass is concealed and the trees are out of bloom, you're, you're walking by this kind of illuminated forest of uh, this kind of inventive contemporary art uh, piece. Okay. Let's look here in Ottawa. This is King Edward before this renovation, and here's King Edward after its renovation, <laughs> right? So what is going on here? And King Edward, by the way, right, kind of continues into these places like Maisonneuve. Um, so we got lighting, and after, I don't know what this is, I think it's been renovated for the eight, eight or nine years since I've been here. Anyway, and this is what they ended up with. You know, how does that happen? This is not inducing, and these are, so these King Edwards of Ottawa, and I know this is not in the officer's jurisdiction, but, but, but Bronson Avenue is, and Bronson looks just like this. Um, so again, you know, how is it that a place like Hull could just move forward and do this? You know, I'm, I'm envious, and uh, and and we as Ottawans can't. What's up? Uh, Bank Street, you know, these small narrow sidewalks, exposed poles, which make no sense in a climate which has so much rain, uh, so much uh, snow and ice. Um, for example, if these instead of having two lanes of traffic and two lanes of parking, if one is eliminated and the sidewalks are widened, it becomes a far more conducive environment to walk. You know, and Bank Street again becomes an amenity instead of a liability. And you take these cars and you put them into parking lots like this, which already exists here in Ottawa, which is a perfectly pleasant thing to walk by. So instead of walking by a stream of cars, you can do this. You probably, you know, probably becomes a money maker. Or you can be even more ambitious. This is a, uh, a, uh, a parking deck, which is in Rotterdam by a very well-known landscape office called West State, who, by the way, is making a, West State is making a proposal for Lansdowne, or what's going to be the half that remains of Lansdowne. Um, and so the parking deck is sunk. These are air intake valves for the parking below. And you have these areas for sports. So basically, the top of the parking deck is turned into an incredible park. And at night, it's illuminated from underneath. So it's a kind of a, this kind of magical constellation at night. Um, and on the last slide, so these parking decks, these connections, these transformations of parks, these are, again are very, very expensive things. But let's just go back to the very beginning. You know, you have to make things desirable. You, you know, um, and I started thinking about, okay, mass transit, things like buses. Well, this is a bus stop. This happens to be in Central Park. This is what we have at the moment. We have the amount of seating is about equivalent to the trash bin. Um, we live in a climate where it can be 30 below, or if it's raining, you know, the poor folks who are sitting here are getting splashed by slush and rain. You know, how about having a cover with a heating element, um, 
I lived in Phoenix for a year. The, the bus shelters have mystifiers so that uh, the air is cooled while you're waiting for the bus. You know, you could have the inverse of that. You could have heating elements here. Uh, this happens to be a bus shelter which is made out of uh, uh, you know, green bottles instead of going to recycling or going into these, um, these bus shelters. Of course, we, in our climate, we would need something more enclosed. But the point is, so we, yes, we need buses, but you also have to think the whole project through. You need a place where people can stay and where they can stand with some kind of dignity. You know, how could you stand at that little bus stop and, uh, you know, and feel any kind of self-worth. So, again, it begins at something as simple as this kind of uh, bus shelter, and then, you know, people get on board, literally, with the buses, uh, with the walking, the bicycling, and then suddenly they want to be in these dense downtown communities. Thanks. I'm probably over. Thank you.